So my name is Brett Nelson from the Department of Emergency Medicine at Mount Sinai. We're going to be speaking about point of care ultrasound today, also known as bedside ultrasound. And the uh, first order of business is to speak about physics. And physics doesn't have to be complicated. We're basically dealing with how does the machine work. So um, in order to understand how the machine works, we can take it back a bit to some of the first animals to use ultrasound, which were bats. And bats are using high frequency sound to locate prey, locate the uh, edges of the cave wall. And they've been doing this for about 50 million years. So it was quite a long time before humans caught up. Around World War I, sonar started to be used. So sound waves could be uh, put out into the ocean, and we would hear schools of fish, we would hear uh, enemy ships, and uh, we started to use this technology uh, during wartime. And uh, eventually, it was another uh, 30, 40 years or so before we figured out that it could have medical applications. So the first iterations of ultrasound weren't that different than sonar. You would have a body in the water, in this case a huge water bath, and you would uh, insinate sound waves into that water bath and detect very vague outlines of organs. So not highly diagnostic, but it really opened up a new world. By the 1980s, uh, machines were used uh, increasingly frequently. Uh, some of the machines were even small enough that wheels could be put on them to move them from one room to the other. But it wasn't really until the 1990s as part of a uh, DARPA initiative through the United States government and the Department of Defense where uh, ultrasound was actually used in a portable fashion, portable enough for a soldier to carry, portable enough to be used by medics in the field, portable enough to not have wheels anymore but a handle. And that really opened up the possibilities for use outside of traditional imaging areas like radiology, obstetrics, and cardiology into the hands of emergency physicians, intensivists, and other groups. So currently we have machines that you see on the right hand side here that can literally be placed in a pocket and this uh, allows for clinicians right at the bedside to answer uh, focused clinical questions in ways that had not yet been possible when the technology was the size of a refrigerator or back in the old days the size of a room. So let's talk about applied physics as it applies to the use of ultrasound. So the piezoelectric effect will be discussed briefly. That basically uh, answers the question, how does that transducer work? We're going to talk about wave theory a bit, which is how the ultrasound transducer creates ultrasound beams that go into the body to give us imaging. Next is imaging, which is how we create the image on the screen. And finally, what are all those buttons on the machine do? I'll just refer to that as instrumentation. So starting with piezoelectrics, um, piezoelectric crystals have a unique property. When pressure is applied to them, as we see in the middle uh, uh, scene here, uh, they create a voltage. And when you apply a voltage to them, they deform in their shape. So once again, if you apply voltage, they change shape. And if they change shape, they create voltage. So using this property of piezoelectric elements, you can actually apply a current in brief pulses to ultrasound and um, change it from an off position to an on position. And when it, the crystal is made to vibrate when it's in its on position, it vibrates the air molecules next to it, as demonstrated in this uh, animation courtesy of uh, Dan Russell. So the molecules near the transducer get compressed together. It, that's referred to as an area of compression. And the area next to it separates out to make room for those squished up molecules. That's an area of rarefaction, like the rarefied air on top of a mountain. So this area of compression and rarefaction occurring in waves uh, over time is basically what a longitudinal wave is and how the machine creates sound waves. And it's creating sound waves above the range of human hearing, so at a very high frequency. So I'm going to speak for a moment about frequency, and we're all familiar with high frequency and low frequency. If you turn on your stereo, you listen to music, you'll hear high frequency sound, uh, female voice, um, or other treble um, that you'll hear from the musical instruments. You'll also hear bass from, from drums or a bassoon or something deep. If you traveled outside of your apartment, your neighbor would not hear the high frequency sounds very well. They wouldn't be able to localize them very well either but the bass would carry. So we've heard this with noisy neighbors. We've heard this with people uh, driving by or outside our windows with a uh, music blaring in their cars. The high frequency sound that gives a lot of detail to the music and allows you to localize it doesn't travel very far. The deeper sounds, the bassier sounds, the lower frequency sounds travel farther, but it's harder to localize exactly where that sound is coming. So in terms of ultrasound, it's all relative because all the sound we're using, both the high frequency and the low frequency, are still above the range of human hearing, but we're still going to use some of the same properties. 
So the higher frequency sounds in ultrasound are used to give us detail and resolution. They're good at looking at nerves and blood vessels and images that are very close to the skin because it doesn't penetrate very deeply, but it gives a lot of resolution. And again, the deeper resolution, the lower resolution is good for imaging things like the abdomen, um, where there's a lot more tissue to go through. It doesn't give quite as much detail as you have with those nerve endings and the superficial tissues of the skin, but, uh, but it penetrates a lot deeper and it can give us information at lower resolution and at lower frequency. So how exactly does the image get formed? So we have this piezoelectric crystal and we're intermittently sending pulses of electricity through it to create sound waves. Those sound waves then propagate into the tissue and they're going to get reflected back. A lot of things happen inside the tissue. Uh, some of the sound waves get reflected, some of them get refracted off in different directions, some of it gets absorbed as heat energy because it is, after all, moving molecules, which is by definition kinetic energy. But the image itself is formed by the beams that come back and reflect it off tissues back to the origin. So the crystal actually spends most of its time listening. It sends out a brief pulse sends off, reflects it off of a reflector inside the body, and a reflector in the body is anything with a different density than what you started with. So if you start off with the gel and liquid water density of the transducer and the gel that's placed on the patient's skin, and you go through skin and soft tissue with your relatively water dense, when you start to hit organs or bone or air, and that change in density causes a lot of reflection back. So then the machine is going to calculate two things. The amplitude of the returning echo, meaning how loud was that sound that came back, and what was the round trip time. A short round trip time means that it reflected back and came back to the transducer very quickly, which means that that structure couldn't have been very deep into the body. And if the amplitude is great, it is, as an oversimplification for now, an object that is brighter or larger. And you can imagine that this would happen um, if you've seen those uh, submarine movies, and you send out a ping, and then you listen and you hear the clicks of returning echoes. And is that echo a uh, ship? Is it a dolphin? Is it a rock formation? It really depends on the movie, but uh, in our case, it's going, to it's going to be different based on which structure it's hitting. So we send out a signal. It bounces off of structures and it reflects back to us. We then turn the direction slightly to the side and send it out again and back and turn it and send it out again and back and over and over again. And when this uh, linear process of sending a signal straight out and straight back is repeated over and over again and fanned back and forth, that one-dimensional line turns into a two-dimensional image. And here we can see individual lines that are generating an image uh, being fanned back and forth to create a two-dimensional image. The Two-dimensional images here are based on the brightness of the returning echoes, how loud the sound is that comes back to the ultrasound machine, and that's why it's referred to generally as brightness mode or B mode. It's also referred to as two-dimensional ultrasound, which is probably the most useful ultrasound. And if this is all you had to work with, if all you had was two-dimensional ultrasound, you could do um, an enormous amount of good. You could uh, make a lot of diagnoses and improve your patient care. So fancier stuff that we can talk about um, at a different uh, time uh, regarding Doppler and, uh, and other uh, bells and whistles that the ultrasound machine is capable of. We're actually going to focus most of what we're going to speak about next just on basic, simple B-mode ultrasound, except for the M-mode. The M-mode is two-dimensional ultrasound that uh, we follow one particular line and what it does over time. So we can see near the top of the screen here that we're generating a two-dimensional image, but we also have this single line going down through the entire image. And that image is passing through the heart. It's passing through the anterior wall, the right ventricle. It's passing through the chamber of the right ventricle, which is dark. It's passing through the gray of the septum, passing through the blackness of the left ventricle, just touching the tip of the mitral valve for a moment before it hits the bright white pericardium. You notice also that there are line markers or depth markers on the side here that tell us the entire depth of our imaging is 16 centimeters. So we're going to follow this line over time. And this line uh, on the screen, it represents depth in the, in the vertical axis, and on the horizontal axis, it represents time. So you'll notice that the top of the screen, again, here is the uh, right ventricle. The darkness is the chamber inside the right ventricle, the blood inside the right ventricle. It gets bright again at about 5 centimeters, right when we start to see the uh, septum. And then it gets pretty dark, broken up by this tiny line, which is the mitral valve, back through the ventricle, and this bright white line in the back is a very bright, echogenic, 
uh, pericardium. So the lines here correspond to the image up there. And if you have a look at this image, uh, you'll start to dawn on you that this heart can't be beating. It's not possible to follow a line through a heart over this many seconds and have no motion, having absolute flat lines without the heart beating. So although that's a morbid first example in what's supposed to be a tidy physics lecture, I just wanted to demonstrate sort of the trivial case of um, M-mode. And this is the M-mode that you're all looking forward to, where we can see a happy mitral valve making its little M shape, which is not why this is called M-mode, by the way. And there's three things I'd like you to notice about this M-mode, through a beating heart, through a live heart, which is the kind of heart hopefully most of the time you'll be looking at. Towards the top of the screen, we see an area that is not moving. The probe is up against the chest wall here, and the chest wall doesn't move very much while, you, while your heart is beating or while you breathe. So that lack of motion is portrayed as flat line straight across the screen. So no motion, green X, top of the M mode on the top, up here, and uh, th I'm sorry, the top of the B mode up here and top of the M mode down here both correspond to the same thing, lack of motion. As the heart's beating in the chest, it's sort of going side to side. So as it goes side to side, it generates this side to side motion, which on the video just looks like motion. On M mode, it's going to look grainy, as you can see from this left and right green arrow. So that motion going side to side winds up looking grainy on M mode. And then the most interesting bit of M mode, and the reason why people started using M mode to begin with, was to look at motion that's going towards and away from the transducer. So towards the top and the bottom of your screen. Top and bottom of the screen demonstrates motion by um, demonstrating lines going up and down. This looks more like what you would see with a seismograph, for example, where you'd follow um, uh, earth movement activity. So let's plant this idea now so you understand M mode in general, uh, what the different types of motion. No motion at the top of the screen, side to side motion in the middle of the screen, and towards the bottom of the screen we have up and down motion. Most people look at M-mode, they focus right on the up and down motion. And that's fine, there's a lot of incredibly useful information you can get from that. I want you to just plant a seed now um, in your brain to remember what the boring part of M-mode looks like, because we're actually going to use it later um, when we look for pneumothorax and thoracic ultrasound, and it's an incredibly powerful tool. So, lack of motion, flat lines up top. Side to side motion, grainy lines. So again, just keep that in mind as we get back to talking about the language of ultrasound. So since ultrasound doesn't work exactly like x-ray in terms of density differences being the only change or absolute density differences being the only thing that uh, generates image density, what we're going to look at is um, instead we're going to talk about echogenicity. That basically just refers to how echogenic or how reflective a structure is. And we'll find out in a moment that structures can be incredibly reflective at both ends of the density spectrum. So when we talk about something being hyper-echoic, that means it's really bright and it sends out a lot of signal returning back to the ultrasound transducer. Remember I told you the transducer itself is, for risk of oversimplification, a water-dense structure, and the gel that's used as a coupling medium between the transducer and the person is also a water-dense medium. And skin soft tissue is, again, roughly water-dense. So that simplifies things a bit when we think about density changes from that point on. If there's a large density change from water density acting as the baseline, we'll see that there's an enormous amount of echogenicity or reflection coming back towards the transducer. So if you start with water, you can get a huge density change in two directions. Much less dense, like air, which we'll find inside the lungs or inside of crepitus or emphysema uh, underneath the tissue, or bowel gas. Or you can go from water dense and have a huge density change to be more dense, like bone, or gallstones or renal stones. So any huge change from the middle, middle ground of being water dense is going to create an enormous amount of echogenicity. So that's why, and this is the huge difference between ultrasound and different other imaging like uh, CT scan and x-ray, uh, the difference is brightness on the screen doesn't always represent density. It can represent things like bone and stones that are very dense. It can represent air, which is not dense at all. So hyperechoic means bright and a very different density than water. Isoechoic means a similar density to the structures near it. So muscle that we see, for example, on top of the screen here in this myocardium is isoechoic to this myocardium down here, and isoechoic to this posterior aspect of the myocardium down there. And then we have hypoechoic, which means less than, but let's jump straight to anechoic. No echoes here inside the right ventricle. No echoes here inside the left ventricle.
We started with water density, and any time we go through a water-dense structure, like blood, like um, uh, bile or urine or ascites or pericardial effusion or a pleural effusion, these structures are going to be anechoic. The ultrasound energy continues unimpeded and it doesn't lose energy, so there's nothing being reflected back to the transducer. So that's all the physics, the real physics that we have to deal with, and hopefully that wasn't too painful. Let's talk about how we're actually going to practically use the machine at this point. So patient positioning is, is very important. It's sometimes something in the ICU setting or in the emergency department setting we don't allow ourselves the luxury of. So really think about ultrasound positioning like you think about physical examination positioning. And when you learned your classical physical examination techniques, you went towards the uh, patient's right-hand side when you examined them. So the operator and the machine should be towards the patient's right. What I find the simplest thing to do is just push the machine in, uh, ahead of me next to the patient on the patient's right-hand side. So I'm facing the machine, I'm facing the patient. My left hand is holding, uh, is being held over the um, the keyboard on the ultrasound machine so I can control the buttons and my right hand holds the ultrasound probe. When you have an incredibly portable uh, device here like the V-Scan being shown here, uh, it's not that much different. You hold the machine in your left hand and your right hand uh, procures the images leaving your thumb free to move the buttons as needed. It's worth mentioning how to hold the probe. A lot of novice users hold the probe like they're um, picking up a dead mouse from a trap or they're holding a stick that's a little too large for them to handle. Um, if you hold the probe like you would hold your pencil, um, that's probably the simplest way to think about it, and it'll give you a lot of control over your motion and a lot of stability. And if you try to hold a pencil way high up in the air, and uh, like in your fist, and try to write your name, it's going to look really sloppy, and that's how preschoolers when they're first first learning how to hold a crayon would, would do it. What you established over time is that if you held your hand down against some surface and used just your fingers to hold the pencil, you can write your name in a more neat fashion. So hold the probe like a pencil and that's going to prevent you from slipping on the patient and the gel. It's going to prevent you from making motions of the ultrasound probe while you're focused on the screen and your hand starts to drift. So it's going to make imaging more convenient uh, when you're doing diagnostic imaging, like having a look at the heart, having a look at uh, the abdominal aorta or other structures. And when you're using ultrasound to guide procedures, meaning that you're going to have a needle in someone's body in your other hand, it doesn't just become a convenience. It's actually fairly critical then to not allow yourself to slip. So using your uh, pinky or using the heel of your hand and resting the probe like you're writing on the patient with the ultrasound probe is going to make a huge difference. So let's talk a little more lingo about the ultrasound probe. And I've borrowed here uh, lingo that's often used in the armed services or the aerospace industry um, just to talk about the three different degrees of freedom or the different ways you can orient the probe in space. So you can f turn the probe uh, and sort of fan it up and down. And uh, if you were in an airplane, you would call that the pitch of the plane going up and down. You can fan the probe side to side or slide the probe side to side. And if you were in an airplane, again, you would call that yaw, that side-to-side -side motion. And finally, um, you can spin the ultrasound transducer right on its axis. If you do that in an airplane, it's called a roll. So if you've seen Top Gun as many times as I have, you've seen Maverick do all three of these things simultaneously, but that's because he's the best there is. What you should be doing is moving the probe one plane at a time when you first learn. So when you put the probe on the patient and you see an image on the screen, look to see what happens if you pitch the probe up and down. Look to see then what happens when you fan the probe side to side and take a look and see what happens when you roll the probe and spin it on its axis. Optimizing the image individually one plane at a time is going to develop proprioception so that you realize when I move my hand this way it changes the image that way. And being able to do that uh, is really critical instead of just randomly moving your hand around until you see an image that looks like it should look. So next thing we should talk about are windows. Ultrasound uh, enthusiasts love to talk about windows. They always say get a good window, use the bladder as a window, uh, don't use the lung as a window, and they don't really ever, ever explain very well what is meant by a window. So let's take away um, sound for a moment because it's a little difficult to understand what an acoustic window is. Uh, let's think instead of other waves and think of light. So light uh, travels through windows. So let's define windows as an area of a building where light passes through easily so that you can see stuff.
So what we're going to try to do is find areas on the body that act with respect to sound the same way that windows act with respect to light. So we already talked about sound from the ultrasound transducer starting off as a liquid density. So if you start off with a liquid dense transducer and you couple it with liquid dense coupling gel and you're going through skin and soft tissue, the be next best thing you should try to image through is something that's also liquid dense within the body. So liquid dense structures in the body act as good acoustic windows to allow sound to pass through so they can image deeper structures and carry that information back. So your ultrasound transducer is uh, really going to seek water and hate air just like this fish. So here's an example of a suboptimal window. Somebody read about the subxiphoid cardiac view. They put the probe in the subxiphoid area and they aimed up towards the heart and you see this image here. And at first this looks like an image of nothing. But this is an image of nothing the same way that Seinfeld was a show about nothing. Beneath the surface there's a little bit more going on. And if you look, there's this bright reflector up near the top of the screen that's causing all this reverberation to come down. And everything on this side of the screen is really poorly visualized behind this bright white reflector. This little sliver here, you see a different gray echo texture, and then bright white, and then dark, and there's, there's something there. So we're getting some image uh, information here. We're getting no image information here because of an incredibly bright reflector that's causing a reverberation artifact. And if you think about the anatomy in this area, that bright white reflector causing reverberation artifact behind it which has to be a very different density than liquid, is the stomach, filled with air, causing no ultrasound energy to pass through it. So it all gets scattered at this point, which makes this area look very bright and causes only reverberation behind it. This little sliver is just the tiniest hint of the liver, which is going to be more towards the patient's right-hand side. So if we move the probe to the right, we unmask more liver, you can get a better sense now that this area is stomach causing that same reverberation artifact going down. And you start to see that there's liver echo texture here. There's a little portal vein here. There's some pericardium. You start to see the right ventricle, left ventricle. So we're getting a better view of the heart paradoxically by moving further away from the heart towards the patient's right hand side because we're using the liver as a window. And we can optimize this view a little bit better and a little bit better by moving the probe seemingly in the wrong direction. But the, the power of being able to get a good window and being able to see the liver well gives us the opportunity to have all the ultrasound energy transfer through the liver so we can image the heart behind it. So <clears throat> we talked about how ultrasound works. We talked about finding a good window and how to hold the probe. One more nuance to holding the probe, each probe has a marker on it. That marker is going to correspond to an area on the ultrasound screen. So there is a particular way you'd like to hold the probe. Um, and uh, I've, I've uh, glued a uh, little dot on this ultrasound probe here to demonstrate that uh, with the Sonocyte brand of equipment uh, on this particular uh, microconvex probe, there is a little groove here that corresponds to the probe marker. On the General Electric V-Scan machine, there's a little notch here that corresponds to where the probe marker would be. So again, you can sort of feel it with your thumb and you can look at it with your eyes and, and know where it is. Just don't lose track of it. And the reason why we don't lose track of it is because there's standard ways that have been developed to hold the ultrasound probe on a human so that you generate standardized images. This way the images you're generating at the bedside uh, in the emergency department are going to look the same as the images that are being generated in cardiology or in the intensive care unit or in the PACU with anesthesia. They're going to look the same in New York as they do in Boston and they're going to look the same as radiology. And if you do the imaging properly, a lot of ultrasound images that you generate are actually going to correspond to how CT scan images are oriented as well. So the way we do this is we orient the probe marker. If you're scanning in a sagittal plane or a coronal plane, meaning you're scanning sort of through the long axis of a patient, you'll hold the ultrasound transducer such that the probe marker is facing towards the patient's head. If you're scanning in a transverse plane, you're going to hold the ultrasound probe in a uh, method so that the ultrasound transdu uh, the probe marker is facing towards the patient's right-hand side. So again, if you're aiming up and down, you're going to be towards the patient's head. If you're aiming left to right, you're going to uh, hold the probe towards the patient's right-hand side. So the utility of this is, in this sagittal view, for example, through the aorta, when you hold the probe towards the patient's head, the probe marker towards the patient's head here in your hand corresponds to the probe marker towards the patient's head here on the screen. 
That means the opposite direction away from the probe is towards their feet. And you can just look down at your hand and get the rest of the orientation. The part of the probe that's touching the patient is generally going to be superficial or anterior, depending on how you're holding the probe. And therefore, anything away from that side of the screen is going to be posterior. So just by holding the probe marker correctly, we know head and foot, anterior and posterior, and we can orient ourselves through this aorta with its uh, proximal branches very well demonstrated. If you're aiming towards the right through the same aorta, we uh, hold the probe marker so it's facing towards the patient's right-hand side. That means that everything towards the dot on the patient is going to be on the right, and everything on the dot towards the screen is going to be towards the patient's right-hand side as well, which means, again, everything on the other side is going to be towards the left, everything towards the top of the screen is anterior, and everything towards the bottom of the screen will be posterior. And Again, this is going to help you generate images that look like your colleagues' images. They're going to look like your textbook images. And in the case of the transverse plane, uh, you might be able to appreciate that this liver, inferior vena cava, uh, aorta, lumbar spine or would actually overlap really nicely into a CT scan image of the same area. So it really sets your imaging up nicely uh, as if the patient is laying with their head facing away from you or behind the screen and their feet coming out of the screen towards you, just like a CT scan image would be done. So, you know how to hold the probe. You understand how the images are being generated. You're standing in front of the patient ready to perform your scan, and you're staring at a mess of controls, which can be incredibly confusing, just as if someone peered into a cockpit and saw this. So let's simplify it a bit. Let's work with what we know and work out from there. Everyone knows what this machine is. Now, six months from now, no one will know what a DVD player is anymore. And thank God I took the VCR image off of this, otherwise I would have been laughed at. So no one, no one reads the instructions for a DVD player. You take it out of the box, you put a DVD in there, and you know that this little square button is stop. You know that the triangle means play. You know that the red circle means record. And you go and you play and it's fine. And that's because on every... DVD player and every cassette player back before the Sony Walkman, um, power, play, pause, these are buttons that are standard in their configuration and they're very well-known icons that represent their function. Not so with ultrasound machines. Every manufacturer has different buttons. Every manufacturer has a different keyboard layout and uh, different bells and whistles, some of which are hidden very deeply in the uh, user interface on the machine, some of which jump right out at you. So any ultrasound machine that you're going to use, you have to know which buttons to look for. And you either figure it out or you ask someone at your institution that's familiar with the machine, and these are the buttons to know. So take a moment and have a look at this because any ultrasound machine in your institution is for your use as long as you understand how to use these. Unless it's not yours, then you shouldn't go to other departments and use their machine just because you know what the buttons do. You want to know where the power button is. That's pretty obvious usually, but figure that one out. Um, you, there's always going to be a button that helps you select which probe you're going to choose, except with some of the machines that only have a single probe attached to them. Gain and depth are the next two, and they're really the most important. You're going to use gain, which has to do with how bright the image is going to look, and depth, meaning how large and deep your uh, image is going to look, uh, continuously. You're going to use gain and depth as often in ultrasound as you use volume and uh, channel on your remote control at home watching television. And the last two buttons are going to vary a bit depending on your uh, workflow. Freeze, how do I stop the machine and just leave an image on the screen? And save, how do I save this image someplace? And save might wind up being print at your institution, so you can generate an image and put it in the chart. Say, freeze and save might mean that you're recording a video clip. It might mean that it's being wirelessly transmitted to a PAC system. So there's an enormous difference in workflow. But the concept in general is that you're freezing an image or a video and you're saving it to some system for future use. So let's have a look at gain. We have three images on this screen. The left side of your screen demonstrates an image that's too dark. The right side demonstrates an image that's too bright. And I think Goldilocks would agree that the image in the middle is just right. So what we're looking for is an image that would look like a good black and white photo. Because what you're doing here, even if you've never used ultrasound before, you've either looked at or you've taken black and white photos. And a good black and white photo is going to have really deep blacks, it's going to have really bright whites and a whole dynamic range of grays in the middle and that's what you want your images to look like. So we can see the blackness in the center of the portal vein here, we can see bright white reflected around the diaphragm and we see unfortunately for this patient a wide variety of shades of gray because here we see uh, grossly metastatic disease through the liver.
So gain can be controlled by a bunch of different types of buttons depending on what your machine is. Uh, a lot of machines here uh, uh, are by Sonosite and the buttons on the left lower section of the ultrasound machine allow you to control with knobs the gain. You can get even a finer control over the gain by using this graphic equalizer appearing uh, structure on uh, other ultrasound machines and that's called time gain compensation. Depth controls how long the ultrasound machine listens for echoes to return. And remember that the longer you listen, the further away a structure would be to send that echo back. So if it listens for a very short time, it's going to be listening just to superficial structures that are, very, that are not very deep within the body. If it listens for a longer time, it'll listen to deeper structures in the body. On the bottom of the machine, we can see that there is a depth um, marker and that depth marker tells you what the total depth of the system is. So this machine is going from 24 centimeters deep to only 10 centimeters deep and we're looking here at an image of the liver and the kidney. And that's too little and that's too big and right in the middle there is just right. So in this particular image maybe about 16 centimeters uh, the idea is that you want to see nice big structures for what you care about visualizing and you don't want to waste any screen real estate on empty space. So don't get zoomed in too close or you'll lose your perspective on what you're looking at and if you're too far away you're, you're wasting a lot of ultrasound energy on imaging structures that doesn't, don't give you any information and you're not getting as big of a picture as you could giving you as much detail. So, uh, again, the Sonosite machines, the depth are these two buttons here, and um, on the uh, V-Scan, we'll show that in just a moment. Again, on the V-Scan machine, the depth uh, marking is towards the bottom right as well. It tells you what the total distance is that you're imaging through. And it's generally best when you're scanning a patient to start off pretty deep, get a wide picture of what's going on, and then close the gap and start to change your depth so that you're only seeing what you want to see. Starting off too small um, sometimes causes you to uh, lose sense of what you're actually looking for, and you'll misread what structures are. So starting off really big, um, wide berth, and imaging your structures that are a little too small at first is better, because then you can make those images look bigger as you need to. So there's basically a um, uh, just a circular control in the center of the V-Scan machine to spend a moment taking uh, a look at how this machine works. And the up and down arrows are going to control the depth on the screen. The left and right arrows are going to control the gain or the brightness of the image. And again, gain is like turning up the volume on your stereo system. It just makes everything a lot louder. It doesn't do anything for signal to noise, so if you're getting a bad image um, that looks pretty fuzzy, it's just going to be brighter and we're still fuzzy. But sometimes the images can be too dark or too bright, so you want to gauge it right in the middle with the gain here. Again, left and right arrows. The uh, right lower side here, we see a picture of a disc, and that button serves a couple of different purposes. It can save an image, it can save a clip, and if you press and hold it, it can record a brief voice recording, which can give you enough time to record a little bit of information about the case that you're describing, so who the scanner is and uh, patient information. Okay, we've spoken a bit about the uh, physics of how ultrasound is generated and how to actually perform ultrasounds at the bedside. So let's, again, make that physics even more practical and talk about how certain artifacts can be made. And uh, in speaking about this, uh, it's worth uh, boring you guys a little bit about a story from my youth. Um, this was a CT scan from a patient who suffered some head injury busy overnight shift. All emergency folks talk about busy overnight shifts. It's apparently the only time we're around. And uh, I got the CAT scan, and the patient looked okay. And I was speaking with the radiologist overnight about how uh, he thought the image looked. And he said, you know, I don't see any bleeding. Everything looks is pretty good. So I said, um, that's great. Good news. I'm going to send the guy home. Um, but did you see image number 53? He's like, yeah, I'm looking right at it. I, I, it looks fine. I don't see anything abnormal. I said, what about the monkey? He said, I, don't, I, I really don't see a monkey um, in image number 53. I have a lot of other scans to look at. And it's like, oh, yeah, I could see his eyes. I could see his nose. It's just kind of funny, you know, image there. I see a little monkey. So, of course, this radiologist was not seeing a monkey. I was seeing a monkey because I'm not a neuroradiologist, and I was looking at uh, vessels and ponds and midbrain structures and creating a face out of it uh, because that's what my brain has been wired to do since I was a little kid, and most of us have done this, uh, but that neuroradiologist needs to know what the true anatomy is. So uh, thank goodness we were a team working on this person uh, that night, and I didn't just uh, run off telling him about the monkey in his brain, which I'm sure wouldn't have sent him off uh, in a good direction. Uh, and instead, uh, it really makes me uh, think about artifacts as we 
we move forwards, especially as my interest is ultrasound and what images do to the way we perceive them. So let's have a look here at an image of the right upper quadrant. This is a patient uh, who was suffering a, uh, a pretty significant blunt trauma, and we can see uh, dark blacks, and we can see bright white, so there's good gain on here. I'm looking into Morrison's pouch, which we'll talk about in another lecture, and I have an image here of some blackness in Morrison's pouch, or a positive fast exam. Gray for the liver, gray and white for the kidney. So one thing I'm seeing here, though, is really bright white, and shadowing behind it. So whatever's happening in this area, it's blocking all the ultrasound energy. It's all being reflected back and scattered back and absorbed at that point, but none of the ultrasound energy is propagating beyond that reflective point. So here we have shadowing. And shadowing in that previous image was caused by bowel gas because air is so much less dense than liquid that it causes an abrupt uh, change in interface and therefore a lot of the energy is scattered. But stones can do it as well and so can bone. So anytime there's darkness, like we see back here, a shadow that's distal or deeper than a bright reflector, which is something that's going to be markedly different in density than liquid, we see shadowing. Shadows should extend way towards the edge of the field all the way to the bottom of the screen, and it helps you sometimes to identify stones, calcifications, ribs, uh, etc. So the ultrasound energy reflects uh, to that, it, it perpetrates down to that structure, and it uh, reflects back and scatters in a bunch of different directions, but nothing penetrates past it. This image demonstrates the opposite of shadowing. We see an eyeball here, another fun thing to image, and the eyeball is totally anechoic. So if we look at the center of the uh, eyeball here, the vitreous humor um, doesn't reflect, it doesn't refract, it just allows uh, sound energy to pass right through it. So it's a wonderful window, by the way, to use the nomenclature we were speaking about before. The area behind the eyeball, deep to it here, is awfully bright compared to the areas next to it. So again, this is the opposite of shadowing. This is called posterior acoustic enhancement. And what happens with this is you see brightness that's distal to a hypoechoic or an anechoic structure. So this happens behind blood vessels, it happens behind cysts, it happens behind the urinary bladder, the gallbladder, it happens behind fluid collections. And this is because in that anechoic area, less sound is attenuated, so sound comes back to the transducer with much greater intensity than the surrounding areas. So imagine two ultrasound beams, both the same energy, both going through similar tissue, but the one on the right goes through this vessel, and the one on the left does not. The one on the right doesn't lose any energy as it passes through that vessel. The one on the left loses energy as it passes through soft tissue muscle. So by the time it gets down to this far on the screen, the ultrasound packet of energy on the right has kept most of its energy and the packet on the left has lost most of its energy. So when it reflects back, the one on the right returns much brighter, louder than the one on the left does, therefore creating the sense that the area behind this cystic structure, this anechoic structure, is brighter than the area here, when in fact these two structures are exactly the same. So if you want to avoid this, and you're going to want to avoid this, especially in areas like the urinary bladder that you want to image behind often to look for free fluid, you're going to turn down the gain, especially the far gain, the gain towards the bottom of the screen so that this doesn't appear too bright or washed out. So let's talk about one last artifact known as a mirror image artifact. Here we see a cross section through the left ventricle. We see the mitral valve. Behind it, we see the pericardium as expected. Behind that, we see another chamber and another reflection of the mitral valve. Now, this patient doesn't have two hearts. They just have a nice, bright, smooth reflector, which is the pericardium here. And when ultrasound energy interacts with a bright, smooth reflector, what often happens is the ultrasound energy goes down into the tissue, bounces off that bright reflector and encounters some structure. In the previous slide, it was a heart. It can be a portal vein, a blood vessel, a metastasis, anything. Um, and then it reflects, bounces back again, hits that bright reflector and comes back to the ultrasound image, uh, to, to, back to the ultrasound transducer, where the transducer points this object as if it came down here. So the reason why is the ultrasound beam, remember, only calculates two different things. The machine can only figure out two different parts of this equation. How long did it take the beam to come back and how bright was it when it came back? So straight down and then it took a little longer than it expected to come back and if it takes this long to come back and it's this bright it must be there 
So that's what the machine then generates, this false object, in addition to the true object that's going to get imaged when the beam eventually comes around to this side. So if you look in any uh, ultrasound textbook and you look up mirror image artifact, probably 95% of the time there's going to be a picture of a diaphragm and a liver, just like we've demonstrated here. And there's going to be a circle above the diaphragm and a circle below the diaphragm, just like we've demonstrated here. And it's always, almost always a, um, a, uh, a cancer. And while I don't not care about cancer, uh, it's not my primary focus in the emergency department, nor is it often in the ICU or other point of care applications to, de uh, to find uh, cancers. But we often want to check to make sure that there is fluid above the diaphragm. Um, so here again is in a real patient what this ultrasound uh, artifact looks like. The ultrasound beam goes down to the diaphragm, reflects off to the side here, encounters a portal vein, bounces back off the diaphragm, and heads back to the transducer. So the machine thinks all this structure here is this liver and thinks this structure here, which is the portal vein, is the structure that was actually up here. So this is how it looks in real life, and now why is it important? Imaging the right upper quadrant, looking above the diaphragm for fluid, normally you'd either see nothing because there's just air back here, or you would see a reflection, a normal mirror image artifact, which is expected of liver tissue and more liver tissue appearing above the diaphragm from the reflection. When you lose that mirror image artifact and instead you see a wedge of blackness, that's how you know that there's fluid above the diaphragm. It's a very sensitive and specific test for fluid above the diaphragm. And uh, again, that's why the mirror image artifact is so important to understand. So in summary, a few things to keep in mind about the physics and the instrumentation of ultrasound. Ultrasound behaves differently than x-ray. It responds to density changes, not absolute densities, to generate its images. Finding good windows, meaning putting your ultrasound probe on the patient in areas that are fluid-filled, like the liver, like, the, like other organs or the uh, urinary bladder, uh, and finding those good windows is going to help generate good images. Stabilize your scanning hand by holding it steady. Hold your probe like you're holding a pencil. And one important thing that should probably permeate all discussions of point-of-care ultrasound and ultrasound performed by traditional providers like radiology, cardiology, and obstetrics. People always describe ultrasound as being operator-dependent, and thank God it's operator-dependent, because ultrasound is no different than laceration repair. It's no different than EKG interpretation. It's no different than bedside manner. It's something as clinicians that we need to practice and get good at. So operator dependent is not an excuse. It's a call to arms, if you will. It's a reason for you to practice. It's a reason for you to read and learn and get good at this because like every other thing that we do, um, ultrasound is operator dependent and uh, we're going to help our patients that way. So. Um, Visit sinaiem.us, our Ultrafound Division website, for more tips and tricks and for more questions. And, uh, and uh, email us or contact us through the website, and we'd be very happy to answer any questions that you may have moving forward. So thank you.